On March 13, 2020, Brianna Taylor was shot and killed inside her apartment by police officers who had come to serve a warrant to search for drugs, none of which were later found on the property. Following her deaths, protests quickly spread across her hometown and later across the country and the world following the death of George Floyd. Protest leaders not only took to the streets, but also to social media to express their grief, their anger, and their frustration. And as a member of a generation which relies heavily on social media as a source of news, I was immersed in their words. At the same time, I was also taking a class on the spiritual author Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist monk at the Abbey of Gethsemane near Bardstown, Kentucky. While he's best known for his autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, and his writings on contemplation and interfaith dialogue, he also wrote extensively on social issues and specifically on race in response to the first civil rights movement of the 1960s. It was these later writings on race which caught my attention the most because he so accurately described some of the current social issues which we are facing that there were several times I actually had to put the book down just to process what he'd said. In many ways, he was so accurately describing our situation that it felt like the Black Lives Matter protesters were echoing his words. In his most famous piece on race, Letters to a White Liberal, Merton directly addresses this titled group, who he believed were more harmful to the movement than conservatives who openly opposed it. In it, he describes white liberals as those who support the movement because they feel they have to to maintain their image of themselves as a liberal, but who value their material comforts, their security, and their congenial relations with the establishment over this volatile idealism. In essence, those who say they support the movement but who will drop out the moment it affects them in any way. Perhaps the best example of this white liberalism in the past year was the trend of the black squares on social media in June 2020. For a few days, it became the popular thing to do to post a black square on your social media as a show of support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And everyone was doing it from kids to adults to major corporations. So it very quickly devolved from a show of support to what was essentially an I'm not racist sticker that people were putting on their feed to make sure that all the people who followed them knew that they didn't actively oppose the movement. It was a very performative action. It didn't force anyone to face their white passivity or privilege and certainly didn't make people fight against racism. Unfortunately, in addition to being performative, the squares actively harmed the BLM movement because they were being posted using the same hashtags the protesters were using to communicate information, quite literally blacking out the voices of the movement. Another example of the white liberalism which Merton would have disapproved of came in the form of the leaders in Louisville and their response to the protests following Breonna Taylor's death. People like the mayor issued official statements of support for the movement, but quickly turned around to clarify on social media that this support was conditional on the protesters remaining in certain areas of the city and staying out of the way. In essence, these leaders were asking the protesters to make themselves ignorable. It is exactly this kind of behavior from white liberals which Merton condemned because he believed that it was leading to the development of a revolution in our country. For as he describes it, revolutions are always the result of situations in which the drive of an underprivileged mass of humanity can no longer be contained by token concessions. Taking this to heart means that liberals can no longer walk the fine line between appeasing protesters with small changes while simultaneously trying to avoid upset among conservative communities who have opposed those changes since the 1960s and beyond. Justice is long overdue. 
and African-American communities are getting tired. Tired of reforms like the ones following Breonna Taylor's death, which increase surveillance in their neighborhoods by moving police officers in. And tired of receiving government payouts for their murdered brothers, sons, sisters, and daughters. When I've had the chance to talk to local protest leaders over the past few months, they have made it very clear that it is by the grace and the patience of African-American communities alone that we have not already had a revolution in a country which was founded on slavery and continues to imprison disproportionate numbers of African-American men and women into a for-profit prison system which benefits off of their free labor. Compounding all of these injustices, and so many more that I don't have time to mention, is what Merton calls the incredible inhumanity of our unwillingness to listen, even for a moment, to what the movement has to say. In Breonna Taylor's Louisville, protests occurred for hundreds of concurrent nights following her death. And not much changed, except a few token concessions. So in this increasingly intense situation, which Merton so accurately described, what is the role of the white liberal if we actually want to play a part in the movement and make a difference? Merton offers us some solutions to this question. First, he makes it clear that we have to listen. Because if we do not understand why people are protesting, and we do not know what they are marching for, they will never believe that we are actually genuine in our attempts to help. And there's no excuse not to know. We have access to a larger glut of resources than ever known to man at any point in history. Every book and every film ever made on the subject of racism and new stories of the injustices in our streets crossing our screens every day. But educating ourselves is not enough. As local protest leader and wonderful poet Hannah Drake says, white people just need to face themselves. We aren't going to study or Netflix our way out of racism. We need to admit and face our way out of racism. And for white liberals, there will be a lot of admitting that we need to do. We have to acknowledge that our privilege comes from the fact that we are in a society that is designed for people who look like me, from what is considered professional dress and behavior, to what dialects of the English language are correct, to who gets an entire year for their history, and whose is relegated to a month and who gets shot in a nighttime police raid, and who gets to walk away with their life. Once we have listened and admitted our privilege, the next step, Merton says, is to join together and look for a way to reform the social systems creating inequality. As he wrote, join together in a creative political experiment not be alarmed at some of the sacrifices that would necessarily be involved. Ending inequality is going to require changing the heart and soul of our nation. It will not be fun, it will not be comfortable, and it most certainly won't be easy. But as Hannah Drake reminds us, who said that this was going to feel good? We have a chance now to actually acknowledge our white passivity and privilege, to make the decision to join the movement no matter the sacrifices, and to heed Merton's warnings to white liberals that if we do not change our performative ways, there will be a revolution. It's time to take the challenge. Thank you.